welcome to the last video I'm going to make on hydroxychloroquine at least in terms of hydroxychloroquine as a therapeutic because the evidence is showing that it simply doesn't work so if you want to skip this video that's fine uh, new trial from the United States hydroxychloroquine does not work as a therapeutic makes no difference at all move on get, get, get used to it go on to something else That's what we have to do. So that's the bottom line of this video. But it is actually quite interesting. It's a really interesting story that we've worked through. Uh, so if you want to stick around for the video, do. Uh, we'll go over what we've sort of... The evolution of our thinking, really, over the past well, 10 months now on hydroxychloroquine. And, of course, it's been so highly politicised. But it is interesting to note that the President of the United States, when he was hospitalised himself with COVID-19 was not prescribed hydroxychloroquine by his doctors. And uh, it's interesting the way that we were, the thinking's evolved on this channel as well as we've tried to sort of follow this story as we've, uh, as we've gone through. So let's uh, skip to it now. Now, the background for this started a long time ago. Um, hydroxychloroquine had been widely promoted as a, as a possible therapy. But this was based mostly on uh, in vitro studies. So, in science, obviously in science, there's two types of studies. There's in vitro, which means basically in glass, or it means it, on the bench, as opposed to in vivo, which is actually in life, giving it to uh, living animals or, or living people. So quite a few things uh, in vitro indicated that it may work. So people followed it up for that reason, and very legitimately so. And we'll look at some other evidence that indicated that it was probably working as well. So anti-inflammatory reduced production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So if it produced less, if it resulted in the production of less pro-inflammatory cytokines, they would be less stimulation of the inflammatory response, therefore less stimulation. You wouldn't get this cytokine storm. You wouldn't get this acute respiratory distress syndrome where the alveoli tend to fill up with fluid. Also indicated to have antiviral activity, it was an iron of four for zinc. So the idea here was that if that was the, uh, the cell, the hydroxychloroquine formed like a little channel and the zinc could go in. And the idea is that once the zinc was in the cell, it would have antiviral properties. That was that kind of thinking. Uh, in vitro reduced viral entry into cells. So it stopped the virus actually getting into the cells in the first place. If the virus can't get into the cells, it can't introduce its ribonucleic acid. Therefore, it can't reproduce. So all of these things kind of made sense. Um, and it was pretty well adopted into routine care for a lot of hospitalised patients for quite some time. Now, the United States, for example, gave it emergency, uh, I think it's FDA approval for a while, and, and then it was withdrawn. Um, so th there was this early promise, um, a drug that's fairly well known, the doses are well known, dirt cheap, it's generic, been using it for years for rheumatoid arthritis and malaria, so if that worked it would have been simply wonderful. Um, so um, UK trial, recovery trial, we reported this quite a lot at the time, 11,000 patients, 175 hospitals in the UK and simply uh, didn't work, no clinical benefit use of hydroxychloroquine but the thing here was the dose was fairly large it was a fairly large dose so that kind of got us thinking because it's not necessarily the more of a drug the better there's an optimum dose for a drug an optimum, an optimum therapeutic dose so was it to do with the dose and then the world health organization did their study as well the solidarity trial Again, lots of patients, and patients are actually more likely to die from this. Uh, so, so they stopped the, the study. But they were giving large doses. They gave 800 milligrams BD, is Pauling shorthand, it means twice a day. In other words, they were giving 800 milligrams uh, in the morning, 800 milligrams in the evening, and then they were given 400 milligrams in the morning, 400 milligrams in the evening for a further 10 days. days. And I think that was a to it was either a total of 20 or 22 doses, so it was a lot. And it was it was high dose. So the uh, but, but, but both the UK recovery trial and the um, 
the World Health Organization solidarity trial showed it didn't work. The World Health Organization trial actually said you were more likely to die with it, but it gave a very high dose. And I must say, I'm unimpressed with the World Health Organization giving a dose which is potentially toxic like that, because some people did die on their trial based on WHO data. More people died in the hydroxychloroquine group than in the placebo group, which of course is, um, is, not, is not good. Now we've done, I've just looked back, this is interesting actually, over, over the last few months I've done four videos on, on hydroxychloroquine. Now the first two, uh, based on those trial data, indicated that it didn't work. And I'll post these if you, if you want to have a look for old time's sake, um, do, do so. so. So these indicated that it didn't work. But then we looked at some trials from, uh, let me think, it was from Belgium and from Italy. No, it, correction, let me correct my language. These were trials from the, uh, the British trial and the, uh, the World Health Organization trial. These were observational studies because in Belgium and Italy, it was given a, as a, a hope for therapeutic. And there did seem to be some benefit, um, around about 30% apparent benefit. Um, so it looked like it was working. And the big difference was, the big difference was, the, the recovery in the solidarity trial used large doses, whereas the, um, the Belgium and the Italian observational studies were using much smaller doses. So we thought, was there some problem? And in fact, it was quite difficult to get the doses of the WHO trial. Um, we only found out the doses on that when the, the Canadian arm was made public. So was it that they were giving too high a dose and that when you ha basically ha less than half the dose, as they were doing in the Italian and uh, Belgium uh, observational studies, uh, it, that it becomes therapeutic? So, so th there was a question mark, really. So basically, the, these ones showed that it didn't work. These ones indicated that it did. But these were trials and these were observational. But this was on a high dose and this was a much lower dose. So there was a, an element of uh, uncertainty here and indeed has been so in my own mind for some time. So fortunately, this new study has come along now. Effects of hydroxychloroquine on clinical status, 14 days, hospitalized patients with COVID-19, Journal of the American Medical Association, peer-reviewed study published on the 9th of November yesterday or the day before yesterday now. Um, look it up for yourself, of course. Um, now, multi-center, good. So uh, different centers, blinded, the patients didn't know what they were getting, the clinicians didn't know what they were giving, placebo controlled, randomized trial. This is the gold standard of research, randomized, double blind, placebo controlled trial. It's randomised. Who goes into the experimental group to get the drug or who goes into the control group to get the placebo? Randomised. Patients don't know what they're getting. Everyone gets the pill. They don't know what it is. It's only the people holding the codes in the sealed envelopes that know who's getting what. So um, very good quality uh, clinical technique. Exactly what we need to get definitive answers. Uh, 34 hospitals in the US, adults hospitalised with respiratory symptoms of COVID-19 or confirmed to have SARS coronavirus 2 infection. So this is a good quality, peer-reviewed, published clinical trial, placebo control, blind, randomized, brilliant, everything we'd hope for. Um, now, uh, patients had severe acute respiratory syndrome, so they're all hospitalized. Basically, they had fluid in their alveoli and probably a microthrombi in their pulmonary blood vessels as well. Data collected from the 2nd of April to the 19th of June 2020. So it's taken them a while to crunch this, hasn't it? Trial was stopped at the fourth interim analysis for futility with a sample size of 479. So they got up to 479 patients. And then they said, look, this is doing nothing. This is futile to continue. So this is good in trials. You, you, have, you have review dates and... Uh, they got up to the, the fourth interim analysis and said, look, this is doing nothing. There's no point continuing this. Scrub it. It doesn't, doesn't work. No benefit. Um, but let's go on. It's, it is interesting. Um, intervention group who got the drug 
242. Uh, control group who didn't, uh, 237. Good numbers, get plenty of good stats from that. So they were given the hydroxychloric, and now they're going to given 500 milligrams twice a day for two doses, 200 milligrams twice a day for eight doses. That's a total of 10 doses in five days. Way less than half of the dose given in the World Health Organization study, which caused an excess of deaths and uh, half of the dose, pretty yeah, about half the dose given in the UK study as well. And a very similar to dose as was given in the observational studies in Italy and Belgium. So um, exactly what we needed to fill this gap. Exactly what we needed. Much more sensible doses. And of course they were given the placebo. and They, they, they were given a, they'd be given a big placebo pill. Uh, twice a day for the first day then they'd be given a smaller placebo pill for you know everything was given in exactly the same exactly the same schedule so the patients didn't know the staff didn't know they would just break the staff would just break out the medicines from uh, coded uh, numbered uh, containers and the patients were randomly <coughs> randomly allocated so all good stuff now the outcomes the primary outcome was clinical status after 14 days after randomization and it was assessed on a seven categorical ordinal scale, which we will briefly look at because it is quite interesting in its own right. Uh, so the scale ranged from death to discharge. So one is death, two is hospitalised receiving ECMO, that's the uh, when you take the blood out of the body and oxygenate it, or invasive mechanical ventilation. Three, receiving non-invasive mechanical ventilation or nasal high-flow oxygen therapy. Four, hospitalised receiving supplementary oxygen without positive pressure, without the CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. Hospitalised, not receiving supplementary oxygen, not hospitalised, unable to return to normal duties and activities. Or hospitalised and able, sorry, not hospitalised and able to return to normal activities and duties. And the patients that were discharged from hospital, they collected this data by telephone. And they also looked at quite a few other secondary outcomes, including 28-day mortality. So, um, good. Um, very little to fault in this study. V very nicely conducted study. Participants. Now, with the randomization, it doesn't matter so much, but it, th th there was 44% female, which is fine. Hispanic, uh, Latino, 23%. Black, uh, African-American, 20%. So, um, good different uh, uh, ethnicity background so it's not skewed by uh, ethnicity background or any uh, socio-cultural factors which might be correlated with these backgrounds. Uh, nearly half were receiving supplementary oxygen. 11.5 um, were receiving oxygen with uh, pressure, the CPAP type of oxygen. And 6.7% uh, were receiving mechanical uh, ventilation, and I think one or two were on ECMO as well. So um, what we've got, in other words, is a variety of uh, patient backgrounds and a variety of um, severity of illness. Patients all received the uh, hydroxychloroquine or the placebo. Medium duration of symptoms prior to randomization was five days, as you would expect, because patients tend to deteriorate in the second week. Um, is the most common time for the inflammatory, uh, severe acute respiratory uh, syndrome, causing the, um, the alveoli to fill up with fluid, the, the acute respiratory distress syndrome. So, as you would expect. Um, results, clinical status on the ordinal scale, day 14, uh, no significant difference between the two groups. It was the same. The odds ratio was 1.02. I mean, it, it would have been, if there'd been no difference at all, it would have been 1.00. So you can see there's essentially no difference, 2% difference, but, but not, not remotely significant. Um, basically, you can say there was no difference. In fact, statistically saying, you can say there was no difference between the, the two groups. The, the outcomes were statistically um, non-significant. It didn't make any difference, despite being randomised, despite being blind, despite the dose being right. 
everything well done but no difference and then all, I'm not going to go all the, through all the secondary outcomes you can read it for yourself but the, 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 they were not, not different either uh, and um, 28 days after randomization the hydroxychloroquine group uh, 25 of 241 patients, 10.4% had died, which sounds high-ish, but bear in mind these patients were hospitalised with acute respiratory distress syndrome anyway, so perhaps not, not too surprising because these were poorly patients. This is testing hydroxychloroquine as a therapeutic. Um, the placebo group who didn't receive it, 25 of 236 died. Slightly smaller number, 10.6 had died. So um, g given that that number slightly larger, very, very minimal, slightly better outcome in the uh, hydroxychloroquine group, but again, not remotely, not remotely significant. In statistical terms, that is just random fluctuation from that. That they are that they, they are essentially the same number in statistical terms. There was no difference in the outcomes at 14 days on the scale, and no difference at deaths at 28 days. No difference. It was the same. Not remotely significant, statistically significantly different. That's why the trial was stopped for futility. Uh, the, the author's uh, conclusion and relevance among amongst adults hospitalised with COVID nineteen respiratory illness from COVID nineteen hydroxychloroquine did not significantly improve clinical status at fourteen days or reduce deaths at twenty eight days. These findings do not support the use of hydroxychloroquine for the treatment of COVID nineteen amongst hospitalised adults. Let that be the end of it. Now the. I know what's going to, what people are going to write in the comments. They're going to say, what about zinc? Well, these patients were all assessed in hospital. So if there was zinc deficient, that would have been identified because they've been, they've been hospitalised and assessed. That should have been identified. At the end of the study, the, the, the authors do identify weaknesses in the study, which is a good practice. For example, they say, well, this was the population of hospitalised patients. We can't necessarily say it would have been the same if this was patients treated at home or patients that were less sick. They admit that, but they just don't mention zinc. It wasn't, just wasn't an issue to them. So I assume what they'd done was they'd measured the patient's zinc levels and if they weren't deficient, it was just, they just didn't consider it to be a factor. But as we say, this doesn't say this doesn't indicate that it won't work for people with mild COVID-19, although given all the results we've had, it's phenomenally unlikely, phenomenally unlikely. Uh, it also doesn't comment on the effect of hydroxychloroquine as a prophylactic. Um, but there again, given these results, it, it would appear that it's, it, again, it, it, it's unlikely. So I think, I think basically, while the, the, these, the, the, these theoretical possibilities of a lifeline for hydroxychloroquine in minimally ill patients or in, uh, as a prophylactic, th there's no evidence really for that at all. So while this study can't comment definitively on that, uh, I strongly suspect that it's not efficacious in those groups. But from this we can say that it's not efficacious in patients that are hospitalised with the inflammatory complications of COVID-19. So I think that is the end of the uh, discussion really of hydroxychloroquine uh, as a therapeutic for poorly patients. Three trials now. Um, the first two, the doses were too high, could have skewed the results. This trial, the doses appear to be just right, consistent with what clinicians are practicing in Italy and Belgium. And uh, it didn't work, it's that simple. Pity, because it's cheap, readily available, can manufacture it by the ton, but it doesn't work. So let that be the end of that matter. Um, but thank you for watching, if you stayed to the end. Um, interesting to work through this. Uh, follow the evidence wherever it leads, and uh, thank you for watching. <laughs>